Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to this month's Value Based Healthcast. Um, the Value Based Healthcast is our monthly session where we get the chance to talk to people who are leading innovation in the delivery of healthcare from across Wales. I'm David Hanna. I'm a doctor. I work in Cardiff and Vale Health Board. Uh, and I've always had an interest in service improvements and innovation. I'm Nick Wilkinson. I'm a consultant paediatrician specialising in rheumatology and chronic pain. And I've had the pleasure of setting up a few services around the UK uh, using value-based principles and uh, thinking about population. So what is value-based healthcare? It's the equitable, sustainable and transparent use of available resource to achieve better or the best outcomes and experiences for every person. And we want to share innovative ideas and approaches which use the principles of value-based healthcare in Wales. Um, these sessions are sponsored by the Welsh Value and Health Centre, but we're not only interested in what's worked well, we want to know about the hard stuff. Uh, we want to know about projects that have failed, the good ideas which couldn't get funding, the projects which started as one thing and ended up as something else. So during the first half of the session today, we'll hear from our guests about the work they're doing leading in palliative care across Wales. In the second 30 minutes, there'll be a chance for us to dig in a bit deeper in, into what our speakers have discussed. And we'd really like to hear from you and our audience today. So if you'd like to ask our speakers a question or contribute to the debate, uh, just type it in the chat bar uh, and we'll do our best to get through all of the questions within the session. So we'll crack on. Um, so first up, I'm really, uh, really pleased to uh, introduce Idris Baker, who many of you will know. Um, he's a consultant in palliative care in Swansea working mainly in the community and has appointments at the universities of Swansea, Cardiff and Amsterdam. Uh, he has a long-standing uh, interest in setting up services and in ethics of decision-making, and I hope I've got that right, Idris. Also, your, your national lead, clinical lead in palliative and end-of-life care and setting up a new Welsh programme uh, using value-based principles. Um, I, I was also interested to read that uh, yeah, you've uh, you've uh, informed a show uh, at the Soho Theatre in the West End, uh, but unfortunately, I'm not sure we get time to get cover that. But I would love to hear more. So, Idris, over to you. Yeah, we'll talk yeah, more we'll about theatre another, another time. I don't know if it's possible to meet at your end. I'm getting a bit of an echo. Um, that's that sounds better. Thanks. Um, thanks. Uh, Nick and, and thanks David um, for the, the introduction to the session and uh, and the opportunity to do this and it's really exciting to be able to talk about um, as uh, Nick says I, I among other things I'm, I'm national clinical lead for palliative and end-of-life care and I've been doing that for a while and having a bit of a, an overview of what we have been trying to do across Wales um, for, for palliative and end-of-life care in, in the recent years and uh, experiencing some of the frustrations and some of the limitations of that. And that's really where this work is born from as much as anything. Um, palliative and end of life care, just for context, we're not trying to introduce new language there. We're really adopting that as an umbrella term that takes in everything you might think of as being part of palliative care, everything you might think of as being end of life care um, across all ages, across the whole spectrum of complexity from the most generalist and the least complex and of course a lot of ordinary dying isn't particularly complex and is dealt with ably by people who are not specialists in that field and um, from that end of the spectrum to the most complex end of the spectrum um, and across not only the statutory sector in the NHS in Wales but of course this is a an area of, of clinical practice where an awful lot of the delivery is in the voluntary sector and voluntary sector organisations such as voluntary hospices um, who, are, who are very actively involved and there's a little bit of geographical variation in that but so this is a programme we're putting together to have oversight of all of that and to give some strategic direction in the context of the national clinical framework in Wales for, for all of that and uh, as per the introduction we've been seeking to design that from the outset around the principles of value-based healthcare which you've heard outlined and and doing that and saying that and I've been saying it over and over again has really forced us to focus on this question well how do you do value how do you do value in palliative and end-of-life care what is it how do you deliver it now there's important background here because as many of you will know there's been a lot of 
pretty impressive work over many years done to develop palliative and end-of-life care in Wales and a very strong focus on getting some of the structures right, getting some of the processes right. And when you look back to where we were 15 years ago, it's not hard to see why that was the focus, because we couldn't deliver anything without fixing some pretty deep rooted historic problems in structure and process. And that's where the focus went. The flip side of that and the limitation of that, that has caused a bit of frustration, I think, is that there's been hardly any focus on the outcomes and the experience, or at least doing that systematically. There's been really good examples of doing it but actually doing it at scale has been you know a, a little bit a little bit messy now i found myself in a consultants meeting a few months ago where as a team building thing we had a, a baking lesson delivered by some expert bakers and we were talking about value-based palliative and end-of-life care in the meeting and it, it suddenly kind of crystallized itself in my mind that what we've been doing by getting the structures right by getting the evidence right and we all love evidence-based healthcare don't we so we've been doing all of that and that's getting the recipe right and we've had good recipes for doing palliative and end of life care for a long time and getting better as the evidence grows. And then we've had processes to check that we're following the recipe correctly. I guess that's really what audit and, and you know various bits of QI are about, aren't they? Is checking, are you following the recipe? And we've been able to show that we're doing a lot of that pretty well with a decent recipe. And you know the bit we hadn't been doing is asking anyone, how's the cake? Is the cake edible? Is it tasty? Is it the cake you wanted? Is it the cake you needed? Is it the cake you're allergic to? So, and we really haven't been doing any of that. And, and this, as I say, has been crystallising in our minds as a uh, as teams across Wales and as the core team with the collaborative driving some of this. The thing, I guess, about about focusing more closely on those outputs, the outcomes and experience, is they don't fix anything in themselves. They're insufficient, but they're absolutely necessary. You can't drive. I think this has been our experience. You can't actually drive improvement sensibly without having decent data. And it's particularly the data on outcomes that we're focusing on in, in, in this session. So we knew we needed, and we've actually known for a few years, that we needed to be able to gather patient reported outcomes in palliative and end of life care. And you know what? People kept telling us it can't be done. And we started feeling that it couldn't be done. And eventually, and Anthony's going to come to talk about the detail of this in a moment, um, but, but eventually it was Anthony who helped me and my colleagues understand why we were feeling it couldn't be done. And it's because we were getting tripped up, getting bogged down in the question of what tool should we be using? And actually what we needed to do and what we've now had some real progress in doing is stepping back from the question of what tool and ask ourselves, what is it you're trying to do? What is it you're trying to measure? How can you do that? What's important to measure? How can you do it without too much burden on the system, on the teams, on the patient, on the families? Who should influence that selection? What do we think, but also what do the people we like to call our patients think about that? Now, I just want to think through what we've been doing without having that. And then because this is very early days, I want to think through a little bit hypothetically at this stage what we think we will be doing once we've uh, we've completed um, the initial bit of work on this. What we do, and many of you will be very familiar with this because this, this is your, your bread and butter, is we get referred a patient, we go and assess the patient, we get some information about what their symptoms are or what their distress is or what their anxieties are, what problems they're dealing with. We act on those as far as we're able to. We review the patient. We get updated information about what's happened since we've taken some of those actions. Hopefully that gives us a bit of a plan for what we need to do next. It doesn't give us any data and it's all a little bit disjointed. It gives us no idea no idea at all for what happens to the people who are on the fringes of that system, who don't quite tip whatever the threshold for referral to a particular service happens to be. We simply don't know. So I could paint for you the picture of another, maybe very similar looking, similar feeling patient experiencing very similar things, similar distress, similar symptoms, where all the same things are happening to them, but none of the things that we might think of doing are happening. <laughs> and none of it's known, none of it's measured. And all of this gives us inequity. We know that it gives us. And there's if, if you doubt that, I mean, look at the better end of life care report from Marie Curie this week and, and 100 re reports before it. So I hope we're at a point now where we know things are not as equitable as they could be, but we don't have data to tell us exactly um, what, what people are experiencing. We don't get any system data at all. We need a new plan. 
And how we see that plan working is this, that the first assessment in, in any service dealing with people with palliative and end of life care needs will be informed by a well chosen set of problems, a well chosen set of patient reported outcome measures. For the people who need referring because of complexity to a specialist service, you're probably going to have high scores all over the place on a set of problems. You're going to have a discussion with the patient, with those close to them, with the team about the priorities, about which things you can act on quickly, which things are most urgent to act on. You're going to act on those. You're going to get a second set of scores. And those scores are going to do two things for you. One, they're going to show you what's already getting better. And you and the first thing you're going to do is you're going to celebrate that and say, look, we've done something that has worked and that energizes us, that gets us on the hook, that helps us see the value of doing this. And then second, you're going to say, but we're not done yet because there's some things where the scores are still raging. And, and then we're going to act on the things that are unresolved. And we'll continually then be getting data that inform that clinical care. In, on the day, during that week, during that month, during that episode, and data for the system as a whole that helps the system as a whole, helps a, a team, a service at health board level, helps the programme nationally to know where do we need to be focusing attention? Where are the things that people are, uh, are not getting good outcomes on, where we could actually focus some development? And it's going to give us, and this is going to be the challenging bit, the oh so important bit, is it's going to give us data on the people who are missing out because the data are going to be coming in once we can get the implementation right, now there's some work to do on this, but once we can get the implementation right, the data are going to be coming in, not only on the people who were maybe fortunate enough to get a referral to a specialist in you know, whatever local team they can get access to, but to other people who are living with palliative and end of life care needs. And some of those are going to say, do you know what, they're going on fine. And others of them are going to say, OK, there's a problem here that somebody is needing help with, which isn't yet being provided. And that's the power uh, we think we anticipate of some of the data we're going to be getting in. Now, the detail of how we're going to do that or where we've got so far with the thinking on that, Anthony is going to talk about far more ably than me in a few minutes because he's been leading the work on it. So I think I'll stop at that point. First of all, I loved, um, well, first of all, thank you for that, Idris. I love the analogy about cake. Um, I love cake. Um, I, I'm, I'm a better eater than I am uh, a baker. But I, I just thought that was a fantastic analogy because so often we focus on process in healthcare and re we reassure ourselves because, because stuff is being done. But what you're talking about is the outcome, really focusing on, on, on the outcome. Can you give us an idea of what bad looks like for, 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 for people in palliative care who, who maybe don't get the kind of outcomes you think they should? Yeah, I mean, bad is uncontrolled symptoms. And we know what some of the common symptoms are. Many on many other people on the, the call, uh, as I say, deal with this daily. But, you know, we're talking about pain, agitation, non-specific distress, sometimes that may be psychological in origin, maybe partly physical, nausea, vomiting, breathlessness, one of the symptoms that's particularly inclined to escalate in intensity towards the end of life, importantly, because a lot of other symptoms, if you get into the last phase of life with those well controlled, they're relatively unlikely to pose a massive problem. So bad might look like some or all of those things not being well controlled. Or it might be by analogy with that other problems that may not be physical symptoms not being well controlled. Your distress about the circumstances you're living in and the effect on your social circle of 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 those those health um, effects that not being mitigated. So you've got this enduring gap between where you are and where you want to be. You know the classic thing of the Kalman gap, as Kenneth Kalman coined it, the gap between uh, hopes and expectations and reality. And so a lot of what you do, a lot of what to turn your question around, David, what good looks like is finding ways that you can more closely align those things and you can't you can improve the reality a bit maybe you've got some work to do in supporting someone to reframe the hopes and expectations but either way you've got that narrowing gap and an improving quality of life and we know so we know a bit about what good looks like we know a bit about how to do that but bad looks like that not being done i'll give you one other version of what bad can look like it's a lot of that being done just before someone dies when we could have seen for weeks and months that there was a need and no one spotted it and the system didn't help us spot it because the system wasn't gathering data to help us spot it. And so 
you look at it and you think, well, it's no one's fault. Well, it isn't anyone's fault, but there's a big problem there. That's a big piece of what bad looks like, is that lack of timely, we call it early sometimes, it's not early, it's just on time when it's needed. Timely identification of that kind of need and timely, effective, sometimes quite simple action on that. And you need the data to demonstrate there's a need and to demonstrate the action has worked. So what I, what I liked hearing, Idris, is is I think what you were saying, and I could be wrong here, is that a proportion of the outcomes that you're looking at are ones that you just need to be assessing for every patient in clinic anyway. So it's it's, it's data that you're really collecting. Uh, and um, so can you just just elaborate on that? And, and uh, what other sort of measures are you then collecting in addition to, to, to them? And how would you use them then to say, well, look, because, because you know, you might have you know, breathlessness sorted or the nausea sorted, but then there's lots of mouth ulcers or there's, you know, just as an example, how, how, how do you balance it? Yeah, and those are, those are really important examples. I'm going to veer a little bit away from directly answering your question because I know that what Anthony says in a minute or two is going to explain that by explaining how we, how we got there. But you're absolutely right with your opening point there that a lot of this is stuff that we're collecting information on, mainly in free text form, Depending on exactly what you mean by data, I think I would say we're not really collecting data on it because nothing that we can analyse or extract or, or or use apart from in, in direct patient care in that episode. And so actually part of this is turning information we're already collecting into information we can collect as data and we can use it more accessibly, I think, in the direct clinical care in that episode and we can use it in lots of those other ways. Um, but but I know Anthony is going to get on to the balance of how we decide what's important to gather because it's all got to be in balance with the burden of gathering unnecessary data. This takes time and energy for patients and families, so we've got to get that balance. Yeah, I guess I was just picking up on the sort of the unintended consequences sometimes of the questions we ask and the the efforts we throw in. So we might put our efforts into you know one aspect of care because that's what the commissioners want or that's what the patient wants, and we forget. The other bits because we don't have the time for that and it's how do we get that balance right how do you know that for the whole person you're 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 getting it on track yeah and what's excited me about this bit of work so far particularly the last year or so is the way that the um program of developing and um, the problems we're going to use has been informed by a slightly wider range of perspectives well no much wider range of perspectives than than i think we've sometimes thought of in the past that's really important. Yes. Um, and Idris, what, I mean, we'll have a chance to talk a bit more about this um, after Anthony uh, has spoken to us. But my final question just at this point was you mentioned about bringing the team with you, and bringing people with you and the burden placed upon teams and clinicians by by new work and, and, and new clinical models. So I was just wondering um, how you went about doing that. How did you help people move to a slightly different place? Well, again, this is very much work in progress. So I think I can probably answer that question better in about a year than I can this afternoon. But what we think is going to work is partly picking up on the point that, that, that Nick was making in, in, in that question. This is stuff we're needing to gather anyway. And all of our teams, and I don't just mean in specialist palliative care in hospices and so on, but GPs working with patients with end of life care needs, oncologists working with district nurses and so on, they all get that we need really clear information about what problems are needing help. They get that that, that, that helps all of us along, it helps us help the patients and, and the families. Um, so what we're trying to do is is put in place, and again, Anthony can probably talk about it more capably than me, but, but, but put in place a, a system, an architecture, which makes it, which makes the burden from a staff point of view of gathering this data as small as it can possibly be. And it's practical stuff like using existing interfaces as the, as the point of entry into the system. So you're not needing to log on to multiple things all of the time to do it, which, which embeds this in your recording and delivery of your clinical care so that it's not extra tasks the whole time. And that's a little bit less of a burden for a team than it would be 
you know, if you're if you're adding on tasks, if you simply say, okay, here's how we do it at the moment, we're going to do it this way instead. We think actually, once you get used to using this, it's going to be easier, not harder to do it. You know, a little bit like when we've been implementing electronic prescribing for inpatient teams, it feels like a nightmare. And within about six months, they're saying, do you know what? This is a little bit easier than using a paper drug chart was. You've replaced the one thing with the other. So that's the 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 aim, but it's a it's a very conscious concern we have is that it would be so easy to do this in a way that becomes burdensome and what happens if you make it burdensome well they don't do it i mean that, that's we've just got to be honest about that we we need people to be able to engage in this and and teams who are already in it hardly need saying does it under colossal pressure so we have to do it, and this is being designed in at the center of the process have to do it in a way that minimizes the burden of doing it and i think and i hope that that will actually result in reducing the burden of some of what we're doing at the moment compared with where we are now. That's the hope. That's the design. And it was seen just constantly much more relevant. You know, is it, well, that's my my sense of you know when I think about it. Yeah. That's what then keeps people on the hook. Once you've got them on the hook is actually you see very, very quickly and we've heard vivid examples of this happening uh, in teams that have done elements of this at a small scale. Um, you see very quickly the difference it's making. Yes. Fantastic, Idris, thank you very much. And um, it'd be great if you could stick around for a bit and we'll, we'll hopefully have a conversation after Anthony's spoken to us. So uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next guest. Uh, Anthony Byrne is a, a consultant in palliative care in Cardiff and he's a clinical director for the Mary Curry Research Centre at Cardiff University. Um, Anthony is going to tell us a bit about some of the work underway in palliative care in Wales. Uh, and when we spoke earlier in the week, Anthony explained how difficult it can be to collect outcome data for palliative care patients. Um, but before you even start to collect data, you need to define your core outcome set. And that's not always easy to do either. So despite these challenges, Anthony and his colleagues uh, from across Wales have made real progress in looking at palliative care with a value lens. They found some really novel ways of getting their hands on data from across different sectors and settings, and they've worked collaboratively with clinical teams and the public to define a core outcome set. So we're really looking forward to hearing more about what they've done and particularly how they've done it. Anthony. Thanks very much, uh, David and Nick, and um, and thanks for the invitation. I, I was hoping to do this talk uh, through the medium of, of dance as Prulith, but unfortunately you insisted that I might show some slides to go through the process of what we've been doing. So. Um, so I'll stick with some slides for now, but you know, probably it can come later. Um, can you see that those slides? Yeah, we, we can, Anthony. Although I think you're not yet on pre presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I just changed that. I just wanted to check if if you could see them. So really, just to to reiterate what it has been saying, it, you know, that we really wanted to move away in Wales from from that approach to assessing services through volume and service activity towards measuring impact on, on patients and families and particularly you know those elements of quality like um, efficiency and, and effectiveness and you know very aware that there have been other international initi initiatives and UK initiatives to to move towards data sets that would allow that to happen um, and to define outcomes that would um, importantly and practically reflect you know what patients and families are actually experiencing um, from our care. Um, and uh, so if from a Wales perspective, we wanted to really focus on, um, on an outcome set that would allow us to, by just by producing the outcome set, by definition, uh, be making sure that we're measuring what matters to people if we did, a, if we did the process properly and, and had a proper consensus around what we should be measuring, that we would be much more satisfied that we're measuring what matters. Um, and obviously we wanted outcomes that would, would help us measure effectiveness, but also that could help us reflect the complexity um, of, of um, the caseload um, for services and, and the impact that, that illness is having on, on people. Um, and by definition, if we've got better effectiveness and understand complexity and have a bit of structural flexibility to be able to change our services around based on, um, on that complexity, then we're going to be more efficient by definition. Um, and so from a Welsh perspective, we wanted to take ownership of deciding what we wanted to measure in the way that Idris has just described and 
and it was about being disciplined and also ensuring that we got consensus across all the stakeholder groups, getting back to the point that you made earlier, Nick, about making sure that, that it's fit for purpose for the individual as well as for uh, as well as for the collective. Um, so, so really the, the, the remit was to describe a consistent way of systematically capturing that. And we, we took a, a fairly uh, disciplined and systematic approach to, to developing it. Um, and the key thing for me um, was getting away from that obsession with the toolkits and, and the, the measures themselves um, and getting the horse back in front of the cart again and, and standing back and saying exactly what is it we want to measure um, not how. So we really wanted to get the plans right before we started uh, to build the house as it were in terms of the, of the toolkit itself and how that toolkit would be op op operational. And part of that, that what do we want to measure is about what matters to patients and families, but also what is going to be important at the other end? What's the output going to be in terms of that service and structural flexibility so that we're getting the right service to the right patient at the right time? And we want to embed it in that concept of, of value and health, and particularly the concept of quality. And, and so we went back to the domains of quality and recognised this is one piece of work amongst others. And I'll get back to that at the very end, just in terms of, of what quality looks like. And there's the safety element and there's the equitable element, as well as the patient centred effectiveness element. And this was the bit that we were focusing on in this project. And I think one of the lessons is be about being disciplined and being really clear and focused on what it is you're doing at any one moment in time and, uh, and understanding that it's an addition to, to what it can, can be offered from a service point of view rather than a distraction or an ignoring of other elements of the dimensions of quality. Um, but you really need to be disciplined in, in terms of what you're trying to do. And by being disciplined and looking at outcomes that are examining impact, um, as I said, the data then allows us to reflect complexity, which can drive that structural flexibility and gives back in the way that Idris was talking about to, to local services as well as nationally in a way that allows us to serve service plan and get, a, get our, our workforce right in terms of skill mix, but also uh, in terms of caseload and, and, and how we might need to, to shift around resources to, to uh, deal with a caseload at any one time. And then you get down to the individual level in terms of being able to work with patients and co-produce plans with patients that are going to be reflected in terms of success by what that outcome um, achieves to that patient, what that intervention, I should say, achieves in terms of, um, of the outcome scoring. And there's lots of issues around processing, process outcomes and, um, and service volumes, et cetera. But for me, um, efficiency is all about doing this stuff well um, I think efficiency looks after itself if you can um, explain things in those in those terms so in terms of of the discipline I think one of the most important things to start with if you want to develop a core outcome set you want to develop a definition of what the outcome is and we did that from the very beginning and that made the process much simpler then when we were engaging with with everybody with an interest in this from patients and care family members and caregivers to healthcare professionals we had a definition of what an outcome is and in essence it's the what that needs to be measured which is affected by that person's illness um, or their uh, environment or palliative care intervention and that seems really simplistic but it's actually critical to being able to do to do this properly and also remembering that although we're talking about patient reported outcomes um, uh, here today it's really important to posit that in the context of the wider idea of clinical outcomes because i think to think think of patient reported outcomes on their own either in isolation or as the only thing that matters is a real mistake because what we want to understand is what's important to measure, what matters to people and then decide which of those outcomes are patient reportable. And it's OK if some of them aren't because they can be joined together with other observational outcomes or healthcare provider outcomes or health, health clinician outcomes as well. And so we took the approach of saying we're not interested in the whether this is a patient reported outcome or another clinical outcome, we just want to understand what's important and then we can map over onto what's patient reportable. And so we developed the project in that way and I just wanted to pay tribute to a lot of people who've supported us doing this project over um, a period of several months, almost a year actually, um, to, to get it completed. Um, and, um, and that piece of work was supported with a, a small grant from Marie Curie to, for us to work on, on behalf of the um, 
the end of life board based in the NHS collaborative. And we, we developed four stages to it. You know, there's no rocket and just enough science in this. This was about understanding that what we wanted to do was get feedback from people about what's important to measure and make sure we consensus on what is core to measure across every person at some time points so that there's enough data to understand from an individual point of view of what's changing over time, but also aggregate data form for a locality level and for a national level to understand how services are actually impacting in their totality on the experience of patients receiving palliative care in Wales. And so we started off um, using a service that I developed through the Wales Cancer Research Centre called PACERS, which is the Palliative Care Evidence Review Centre. Um, and it's it's really there to try and do what, what you talked about earlier, Nick, which is to try and minimise the burden on, on, um, on healthcare professionals as well as patients of, of getting the evidence and understanding what the evidence is. And so we do rapid reviews to try and, and support policy decisions and clinical decision making. Um, and we use that service to do a review of all of the outcomes that are currently being used internationally and what are felt to be important outcomes. And we included everything at that stage. And um, we didn't try and define it right down to the definition that we'd used. We, we produced an, a lot of concepts that we then used a multidisciplinary stakeholder group to refine down into a long list, really judge it, judged by the definition, the clear definition of an outcome that we'd used. Um, and we wanted to do that so we could then go out to the wider community and have a, a, a stakeholder ranking survey of to prioritise the main outcomes of importance. And we used social media, we used um, 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 kind of snowballing through um, word of mouth um, and we used uh, official channels as well to publicize this as a survey that was important to, to everyone so that we could look at the, the long list of outcomes and refine them down into a final set that was then reviewed by an expert group. And so all of those sta four stages are very logical, very simple, but very impactful because what they define is a rigor in terms of what we've done. But most importantly, from my perspective, you know, no major surprises, just consensus that this is the right thing to do. And I just wanted to briefly mention the stakeholder survey because that was a survey where we would hoped maybe to get 50, 60, 70 responses from, from people, but actually we had 213 responses, I think, 40% of which were informal caregivers and we had patient feedback as well. We had palliative care, healthcare professional feedback, but we also had social care provider feedback, we had NHS managers, third sector managers involved as well. So we had a really broad church of people um, putting their oar in in terms of what was relevant and, and really good um, response rates from across the whole of, um, of Wales. And so this is the process really condensed down. We started off with a literature review with 62 concepts around what might be outcomes. A lot of them were process driven, but we left those in so the expert workshop could refine them down, deduplicate them, but add in others that they felt were important and that we'd missed. We ended up with 23 outcomes to go to the survey and we ended up with 21 outcomes um, in the final outcome set when we went through all of that. And what, what we ended up with was those 21 outcomes across six domains. Um, some not many surprises in there, but some very interesting choices, particularly around the emphasis around participatory function and activities of daily living and cognitive function as well, which um, which um, surprised me slightly, but were, were well, very welcome additions. And it just emphasised the importance um, of that consensus process. And we were able to develop a, a, a summary report of that. Um, for the end of life board so that we could generate the next element of, of, of what needs to happen. Um, and so what we've been doing more recently now is working with CEDAR to confirm the actual toolkit, the measures themselves. Um, and the, the absolutely vital thing about all of this was to do in an integrated way. So we've, we've everybody has known what we're doing. The NHS Collaborative have been very aware of what we're doing. Um, the um, Value and Health Centre have been very aware of what we're doing. So, so it's very integrated and we've learned hugely from, from those collaborations in, in the infrastructure that's going to be required to, to deliver this now and, and the IT infrastructure for collection, but also the decision making on, on when to collect and how to present it locally and nationally and what the dashboard visuals are going to look like. And that is way beyond our experience and our and our abilities and from a palliative care perspective and a really exciting point to be at because we're now 
able to, to work with our colleagues in value and health, work with our colleagues in CEDAR um, and be to the forefront as a kind of a palliative care exemplar for other specialties to be able to say this is a really good way of presenting the visuals of, of what the individual patient data is, but just as importantly, the aggregated data for a local team to develop their service or at a national level um, as well. And, and in the terms of the bigger picture in terms of value in healthcare, what's as important for me is that this is just one piece of work that we're trying to do to, to generate that whole um, deliverance of value in healthcare that it was talked about. And so we've got a very data driven approach and um, we've been doing some work with um, the Wales Modeling Collaborative and uh, DHCW around population level data sets and, and interaction with services, particularly on scheduled care. We're very keen um, on, on the outcomes element of it and how we make sure that it aligns with international norms and standards um, and, and have that kind of transformative policy impact. And I think what we've worked very hard to do in palliative care in Wales, and I think done uniquely successfully really, is to try and get that alignment across clinical policy and academic environments where we're all thinking about the same things in the same way at the same time so that we you know with this project is a really good example where we've worked across DHCW, the NHS Collaborative, the Value and Health Centre, Cardiff University and the Marie Curie Centre um, and we're, we're now beginning to to see the policy benefits of that um, but also drawing in other academic collaborations, for example, with the WHO Collaborating Centre on Safety um, and, and HealthWise Wales, for example, in terms of prospective cohorts as well. So I'll stop there because hopefully that just gives people enough to hang their hat on to ask some questions. Oh, Anthony, thanks so much for that. And um, I've got a couple of questions, I'm sure Nick does too, and it's probably got a good opportunity to remind our audience as well that if you would like to ask Anthony or Idris, anything about what we've talked about already today, just pop a question in the chat bar uh, and then we can, we can, um, we can ask uh, Anthony and Idris. So uh, Anthony, the, the two things that struck me about what, you, what we talked about today and, and when we spoke during the week was that there's two things here. One is to decide what you're measuring and, and you talked about your engagement and different stakeholders and that process. So I think I understand that um, in terms of how you did, although it, it's a mammoth task. So um, it, it sounds amazing what you've done. The how, the how to collect the data is, is a totally different proposition. Can you yeah. tell us a bit about how you went about that? Because something we hear time and time again, if you want to work at a systems level in health. Yeah that it's very difficult to bring together inf information about the same patients from, from different places. Yeah, and and we haven't got there yet, but we're in the process of, of doing that now. And that, that that's what the exciting bit. And I think, how do you do that? I think what you don't do is do it alone and, and do it separately. And I think the the big success that we've had is by understanding that, that there are lots of moving parts here and we not we don't have control of most of them so we need to be sitting alongside and in the room with the people who do and so in my advice would be if you're starting a project like this it has to be embedded within um you know the nhs collaborative and and the infrastructure that that has because that's where you're going to find um, the it support and that's where you're going to find the, the real innovation in terms of for example just the visualization of um, of the outcomes and you know within the within the delivery unit there are people who are working at the moment um, purely on that on that issue of of outcome visualization and um, that's going to be so important not just from from a healthcare professional point of view and and just how you um, look at that data either on an individual basis or you know on a on a an aggregated basis but also for patients as well and um, and just to give you little examples, I mean, I, I can't remember what you call them, but you know those kind of spider diagrams. If you do brain training, you get those kind of spider diagrams of, of the bits where you're doing well and where you're not doing well. You know, you can do that with outcomes and you can, so you can have your brain training spider map of how I'm doing as a patient, but also aggregated as a service and saying, well, actually, if you look at um, the, the symptom burden that Idris talked about, on first assessment and then when we do our second assessment then you aggregate those you can see that the map 
kind of getting smaller and, and that we're we're doing something positive from that point of view. And just that feedback in itself is really important in terms of of motivation and, and morale. Um, and it and you see that and you think, well, you know, it only happens because I put the stuff in in the first place. So it, it becomes that positive loop feedback um, that we talked about. But it also really importantly allows you to sit down and think, crikey, we're not doing well in one area here. We've got a skill mix issue or look at the complexity of our service and we can go back and, and generate the, the data that says give us more resource and more help. Yeah. I think. Um... <clears throat> You know, just talking to patients and getting feedback and um, is, is, is such a critical part of of, um, of any consultation, but also because there is the inner geek in us all, or maybe it's just me, that, that a few little numbers and a spider diagram, just mapping it out and then comparing it to the one before, just, it's, it's like a research project when you've actually crunched the numbers and you go, oh yeah, so it's that little reve revelation moment, isn't it? And it Absolutely. It, Part of engagement and that's not easy to do but you know it's great i can hold my hands up and say that's not my headache uh, but and somebody else wants that headache that's the great thing that i've been you know as you get to talk to people who are interested in these things people want to take those headaches off you and say well actually i'm doing that so yes. let me do that bit and um i think uh, kathleen is up from cedars on the call and uh, you know i was speaking to kathleen this morning and um you know that she she's doing an awful lot of the support for us in terms of licensing and translation to Welsh of, of, of outcomes but also how do you get the data from you know if if the palliative care nurse has been out in somebody's house and putting this on a, on a tablet and getting it into the, the system how do you yeah. translate that into a score well yes. that, that's what what Kathleen and her colleagues do so yes. it, it's about being in the in the in the, the, the right room with the right people um, to make that happen in the first place. Otherwise, it becomes really demoralizing. And we've all been there. You know, we've all been trying to do small projects and not getting anywhere. I think yes. what, what doing this within the context of, of the value and health agenda has allowed us to do is, is meet people who are enthusiastic about getting that data together. Perfect, we're all teams. And it's, and, but you mentioned that there were sort of 2021 outcome measures. What proportion are they clinical, uh, in, you know, can you separate it out into process? So, and yeah, so there's 21 outcomes, but but you won't need 21 different tools to measure those. You know, oh, a lot of them will be. And the vast majority of them um, will be patient reportable. There are one or two objective ones in there, but for me, that's OK, because what we shouldn't be doing is saying that, you know, there should only be patient reported outcomes there. Patient reported outcomes are incredibly important, but they're going to, to be most impactful if they're supported with with the generation of other evidence around them um, and so the, the important question is what is it that you want to measure and then we decide how and and what was interesting was during the presentation you separated out safety from the outcome measures and you know for me just thinking about end of life because it's the same as you know looking at kids safety is so important you know and, and as well as validation and and I just wondered, is that not an an outcome measure, or is that not something that you can you 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 can, is easy to measure? It's difficult to measure, but it's a absolutely key piece of work for us, and that's why moving forward from an academic point of view, we've been developing some collaborations um, with colleagues at Cardiff University, and particularly Andy Carson Stevens, who who you know is part part of the WHO collaborating centre on on patient safety, and it's about understanding from a palliative care point of view what healthcare related harm looks like what's the definition of it it's really difficult isn't it there are no clear definitions and so one of the pieces that we want to do of what we want to do with patients and families is to say well what does that look like to you and and can we co-produce a definition of what um health related harm looks like from a palliative care point of view so we can then say well what does what does better look like um, and so and so what I was trying to demonstrate there is to say by looking at effectiveness outcomes right now, it doesn't mean that we it is at the expense of other things. We, we're looking at the safety alongside that. Um, Idris and, and the team are doing a lot of work around patient experience outcomes. And then we're working on the large population data set, which for me, again, is another really important reflection of patient experience 
at a population level of, of being able to say, well, this is what the population experience of unscheduled care has been. Yes, it, 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 because, you know, safety is, I don't know if you know the Maslow hierarchy of needs, you have to feed yourself and the next thing is safety and you can't do anything beyond that or, or get a sense of well-being without that. And, you know, so one, for me, it's if you can't, if, if it's complex, then just sometimes just asking the patient, do you feel safe? You know, is that something that you could do? Uh, yeah, and you can do that in several ways. I think the most important way is to say to the patient, well, what what does safe yeah what does safe look like? And there and by doing that, you get a definition that you can more consistently then measure. Yes. Um, but but the other work we want to do is by saying, well, if we're going to be collecting this data, let's also dig a little bit deeper um, and and perhaps with a cohort of of patients and families be able to look in a bit more detail about how all those systems are interacting because we want to collect data at a population level, we want to collect individual patient data and then we want to say well that's that's all very well, that's giving us some very interesting numbers that we can try and interpret but in reality what lies beneath that is systems of care not working together um, yes. as efficiently as they could and the best way of finding that out is to talk in a bit more detail with patients and there are some really interesting Kind of realist, real-world methodologies that you can use to do that. Well, Anthony, thanks so much for that. I know we've got some questions coming in. I've certainly got a few more questions I'd like to ask. But um, Hilary Williams, who I think is a consultant in Belinda, has asked, um, "How will you involve patients who are not directly involved with palliative care, but may well have end-of-life needs?" And, and Idris, I know you mentioned your fear about all those patients who don't get referred to palliative care. So, so going back to Hilary's question, how, how do you, how do you, I suppose, involve those patients? Yeah, uh, and it's, you know, it's not always a fear because plenty of them don't get referred because they don't need referring. But what worries me is the not knowing, not having data to, to inform those judgments necessarily. So um, in parallel with what we're talking about today, we're also trying to beef up the work on timely identification of need for palliative and end of life care and trying to turn this into something that's a lot less based on diagnosis. And we've got all the heritage for quite a few services of only really thinking seriously about people with cancer. So we've moved on from that over the, you know, the recent decades, um, but, but thinking beyond a set of diagnoses and thinking, um, and there are established ways to do this, and I won't bore the meeting with them now, but established ways to look at timely identification. And a lot of this is about communication. So people used to have a pop at GPs quite often for not spotting the person had palliative needs. And you look back at all of the correspondence there's been from 10 years of hospital clinics, you know, COPD or heart failure or whatever, and at no point has anyone mentioned to the GP, yeah, we think there's now a turning point in this person's condition. The hospital specialist knew it, no one told. So we're looking at ways that we can foster good communication between the different teams, different specialties that might be involved in a person's care to, uh, to, to foster that timely identification. And then when you've got the timely identification, then you offer, and this is going to be part of the implementation, although I think it's going to take a little bit longer to get to, then you offer the opportunity for people to record those, those outcome measures. And you gather that and you put the architecture in place first so that you can gather that without it being burdensome, but also without the data sitting there. You don't want to collect these data and they sit there doing nothing, particularly when people have told you something that's really important. So you put the architecture in place first that makes it possible to gather those data so that someone who is involved in that person's care sees, ah, there's something here that's that's lighting up. There's something here that needs some kind of response, at least needs a conversation about what response might be needed. But it's got to be driven by that timely identification. So that's work in parallel with this that the new program is seeking to try. No, th thanks. A, a question for me a little bit, bit specifically about the, the outcome measures. So uh, the bit of healthcare I work in is, is paediatric emergency health. So I, I work in emergency departments, I see children who come in with minor illnesses, minor injuries, major trauma and everything in, in between. And I'm really interested in developing core outcome sets from my group of patients who are a very heterogeneous group. With palliative care, did anybody say at the start of this, hang on a second guys, this work's been done before, we can just take these outcomes off the shelf it's been done elsewhere and we just plug them into Wales and off we go. 
were, were there voices like that at the start of this? Because I know that you've gone on this journey to define your core outcome set, but were there people at the start of this who said, no, no, guys, it's okay. This work's already been done. Shall I, shall I take that, Idris? Yeah, so um, absolutely there has been work done elsewhere, you know, within within the UK and um, Fliss Merta and Aaron Higginson and others through the Cicely Saunders Institute have developed an excellent out outcome assessment um, toolkit and in the palliative care outcomes collaborative in Australia have done something similar. And so we were starting this process, as I say, not to, to suggest that we had a rocket and lots of science that was very specifically about consensus and saying, look, is this relevant? We can take those off the shelf. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, is it relevant to the Welsh health and social care economy? Is there something specific that we're missing um, that's relevant to Wales? And, and if we're going to try and collect this data, we need to make sure that everybody's on board with it um, and it makes sense to everybody because otherwise that data is not going to go in. So that was the whole um, emphasis for me behind it was to be disciplined about deciding what it is we were asking and what it is we wanted to measure. Um, so that if when we got to the, the toolkit, we could say, well, let's just map across. We, we've now, it took a lot of time to say to people, do not think toolkit, do not think outcome measures, just think what's important to you um, if you're a healthcare professional that you want to know about, or as a patient, what is really important? You know, at the end of the day, if somebody comes to me and says, oh, Dr. Byrne, did he do anything? What is it that you will have wanted him to do? And then we could say, wait, now we've got a consensus and guess what? That OAC tool or the Peacock tool works really well. And that's almost the point we're at. So it wasn't about trying to go out and, and develop a new measure. It was just simply to say, these are the things that matter to the people of Wales. Yeah. Uh, so my hope is that you know, you, you're pioneers, I suppose, you're, you're, you're blazing a trail in terms of that process. But the more clinical groups and, and, and teams that do exactly what you're doing, which is trying to define what good looks like in terms of outcomes, rather than what can we do to patients, the better. And the, and the more teams that do that, then the, 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 the more familiar we are at a national level with trying to facilitate that dialogue. And you would hope that the, some of the barriers that you guys have had to break through um, and others have had to break through will so, so suddenly not be so big. Absolutely. And, and I think the key thing to that, Dave, as well, is that we also don't keep creating more toolkits and, and, and going off trying to validate more, more measurement tools that actually, you know, we'll be able to look within a bank from within Wales and say, well, look, these are already being used. Let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's just use what's what's here. And now that we've decided what it is we want to measure, and that's where the great work with the Valley Health Centre and CEDAR is, is in trying to, to consolidate those kind of banks of, of outcomes that are already licensed and, and being used in Wales. And ultimately, when we suddenly stand back and think, oh my God, what we've we done, we've got, you know, 27 specialties and they've all got their own outcome sets. There will be a point, I hope, in Wales where we say, well, what are the two or three core outcomes that we should measure across everybody in the population? And, um, and that would be a great place to get to. And, and you mentioned the Wales Value and Health Centre there, and obviously the, the Wales Value and Health Centre sponsors this session. Can you tell us a little bit about just the relationship there and how you were helped by CEDAR and, and the Wales Value and Health Centre in, in the work you've been doing? Um, yeah, I can I can certainly start with that and say that um, it's been absolutely essential to what we've been trying to do. And it's part of the work that we've been um, really um, kind of trying to underpin over the last five or six years, which is to try and get the kind of evidence and data driven approach into our considered judgments when we're making policy and strategic decisions as well as clinical decisions and getting that access that I've talked about before across you know, policy and strategy, clinical and academic. And, you know, I, I wear an academic hat as well, and I'm absolutely passionate about, about our research being patient focused and at pace into practice. Um, which is very much what the Vibrant Health Centre are looking to achieve. And so what they've been able to do is, is to give us um, some funding, but also the infrastructure and collaboration to be able to identify the people who can help us 
most at the right time and, and the infrastructure around that whole understanding of how you you collect the data, integrate it and present it back again. So we've had a few questions, um, just really maybe directing at Idris, just around <clears throat> the whole system. And, and you mentioned before about the patients that we're missing. You know, for me, I know in my service, I'll see one with, with, with chronic pain, but I know that there's 10 to 50 that I'm not seeing. And, and I need to know them and what's happening with them. Could you just elaborate on what you meant by, by, by those we're not seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think we're in the same position, um, except that the numbers are maybe a little bit different. So I think it works out in most systems, and I think Wales is, is typical here, that about 30 to 40 percent of people with palliative and end of life care needs have been seen by a palliative care specialist somewhere towards the end of their illness. And that, that we know by looking retrospectively at people who have died. Um, now, we don't think that the number of people who need to see a palliative care specialist is 100 percent. We think it's smaller than that. Clearly, it excludes some of the people who die so suddenly that there is no antecedent illness phase. But it may also, well, we think it does also include some people who've got a progressive life shortening illness, but whose symptoms and distress and other problems get a, a decent response from whoever else is already involved in their care. And that always or almost always includes a general practitioner. The only exception being someone who's admitted to hospital at the start of their final illness and isn't discharged, but they're the, really the only exception. GPs are central, district nurses are typically central, oncologists are typically heavily involved if it's someone living with cancer and so on. You could think of a of 100 examples. What we don't know, I think with accuracy, is how many, and maybe more to the point, exactly which people do need specialist intervention for what, at what point, and how that should be delivered. So, and this is, this is a reflection of the lack of data as much as anything, because we've got decent evidence in the literature that gives us some idea of how many, but doesn't tell you the answers to the other questions, and particularly the which ones and when. And, and so looking at the system as a whole, that's really the case for the importance uh, of, you know, really tackling the question that Hillary was raising in the chat, which is about how do you make sure that there is some kind of information coming in from the people who are not yet so that someone is supported in a decision about whether they, for the time being, need to become a person who, who does see a specialist. I, I wouldn't want to get remotely territorial or indeed theological about um, exactly who does and who doesn't. And, and so, you know, we, we find in, in hospital palliative care um, that, that very often someone who doesn't really need the support of a palliative care specialist if they're um, under the care of an oncologist who's used to doing some of this stuff, might need a bit more palliative care support, specialist palliative care support, if they're under the care of a, uh, a specialty who's much less frequently involved in thinking about end of life care. So I've had rich and powerful conversations with ophthalmologists who really want to do the right thing when they need to offer some end of life care, but clearly typically lack recent experience in doing so much of it. So, you know, we adjust the threshold of complexity and so on, but we don't have the data to drive that. And particularly at the individual patient level, we don't have good enough data to drive the understanding about where um, those delineations should fall and how the processes therefore should work. So it's driven instead by historic dogma, which goes back to the 1980s and 1990s. We think we can do better than that if we get the right data. Well, uh, thank you to you both for a fascinating um, session today. Um, I've, I've loved it. It's been brilliant. Um, and, and f f you know, this session is all about value-based healthcare in Wales and, and about delivering outcomes that matter to people with the resources available to us. Um, so today we've heard all about what's happening in palliative care in Wales uh, and, and obviously the attempts that Anthony and Idris have been making to establish this core outcome set. Nick, um, any particular take-home messages? For you today? Oh, that, that, that is possible to bring order to complexity. I think that's what we're, we're, we're looking at and that's, that's what I value. And it's the breadth of what we're doing and it's not just the patient in front. Um, it, is, it is a whole systems approach which, which I think is, is key here. And I think there were so many other questions that we could have gone on. So I think it will be, we'll probably be inviting you back to talk again about 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 outcomes especially when you've got more data and then we can start to get into the nitty-gritty of that that would be fabulous yeah 
And, and, and for me, it was, I, I love the, just the idea that it's not about the prom platform. Um, and and it, it's actually about thinking right back to first principles, what's important to patients and, and actually who would have thought it, but we actually need to speak to patients and families and stakeholders and actually ask them what good looks like for them and then base our data and what we want to collect after that. So, so thank you both for joining us today. Thank you for our audience. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in January at the next Value-Based Healthcast. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all.